Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and you're listening to episode 131, which is the very first part in a series looking at Burmese amber. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Javier Luque of Harvard University, and we put his recent discovery of a crab preserved in amber into context. We'll be discussing everything to do about crabs, from how they live and how they grow, to when they evolved and what their fossil record is like. Also, why do things keep evolving into crabs? This sets us up perfectly for the second part of the interview, in which we take a look at the specifics of this remarkable fossil itself. But as always, we've got our admin to get out of the way. so. Firstly, apologies for the delay in getting an episode to you, and I'm sure you'll all know why by now, and yes, I had another short notice stay on an oil rig. It's all part of the job, I'm afraid, but it means that I can't record or take any equipment with me. Secondly, having launched our Patreon account last episode, I wanted to thank and welcome all of our new backers. If you've not yet checked it out, please follow the links on our website and social media channels and take a look at the reward tiers we have to offer. This month, we'll be releasing our annual review show and also the first of our invited lectures, so please sign up if you wish to see those. Finally, and as always, if you enjoy the show, please like, share, comment, or leave a rating. Anything you can do on social media really helps the episode reach as many people as possible. Remember, The images to accompany this episode are on our website, paleocast.com, where you can also find all of our past interviews and much more. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Javier. Welcome to the show. Hi, Dave. Thank you for having me. We always like to start our interviews off with getting to know a bit more about you. So can you tell us what your route into paleontology was, please? Um, I wanted to become a paleontologist since I was around four years old. And this is way before the, or not that way before, but in, in all, before enough from the Jurassic time era of movies. Um, I was drawn into paleontology because uh, an expedition we did with my parents to a part of Colombia, South America, my home country, that is rich in fossils from the Cretaceous period, mostly marine reptiles and ammonites. And the fascination about how an organism can be preserved through time and yet make it to today in such a way that we can take a glimpse into a distant past was so fascinating that I knew from early age, from an early age, I wanted to become a paleontologist. Did your parents have any background in paleontology themselves or did they just think it was going to be a nice day out? <laughs> Not at all. They they have normal, regular lives. I was the one collecting you know, rocks and bugs and beetles and tadpoles and bones of dead animals but they will they were always very encouraging even though my room looked like a little museum they were always happy to see how excited about i was about the natural world oh, it's good that they supported you with it because I, I don't know what it's like to have a four-year-old but i expect that if you took them for a single day out thinking that would be the end of it <laughs> but then 30 years later or however long it is they're still <laughs> Yeah, full totally. on paleontology. <laughs> I am very lucky that I got to stick to my childhood dream of becoming a paleontologist. Um, no, that doesn't often happen, right? Yeah. So my follow on question to this is always, what would you be doing if you weren't a paleontologist? Was that never an option for you? Since I was that age and and during my childhood, I knew I wanted to be an ologist, archaeologist, anthropologist, biologist, geologist. And it was through my undergrad experience that I was exposed to geology as a career, basically because in the pensum and the syllabus of the curriculum, they had a, a signature, a class on paleontology. 
And that's why I am, uh, my undergrad is in geology, and then I follow up the path towards biology because paleontology bridges both worlds, the geo and the, pe- and the bio. Now, if it wasn't for that, I would be a biologist or an archaeologist or who knows what else, but something that involves digging things from the past. But a lot of our interviewees always have some kind of secret talent or a multi-talented do you play an instrument? Do you dance better than anyone else on the dance floor? Is... <laughs> this doesn't have to go in if there's nothing there. That's awesome. Um, I, I enjoy painting and drawing very much. And I like uh, sculpting, um, do like manual activities. Music has never been my forte, but one of the, let's say, Good things out of this pandemic is that I got to also start fulfilling a childhood dream of playing violin. So I got myself one violin. Wow. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just making <laughs> it sound somehow. <laughs> so, but it's good. I don't have to, to be good at it. As long as I enjoy the process, it is what it matters. And I do dance a little bit uh, as a Latino. Salsa is one of my favorite um uh, things to do dancing salsa it doesn't mean that i'm great at it but i sure enjoy it good so presumably now you're back in the office in harvard um what are you currently working on what are your research projects right now i am working on different projects that align with my overall research interest on understanding the evolution of organisms through time and space with a particular focus on the tropics and we have we are very lucky that the tropics are the places with the most diversity in the world in terms of species richness and and that allows me as a tropical paleontologist explore questions about what are the mechanisms that have led to today's diversity something that is curious but not surprising is that despite of this of the tropics being hotspots of diversity and being regarded as cradles as, and museums of diversity by some, it is the place where we know the least about their fossil record. So in order to make sense of our present, we have to take a look at the past. And that's my motivation to study the fossil record in the tropics. And crustaceans, particularly crabs, shrimps, and lobsters, they're all together called decapods. They have a really good fossil record. And many of these groups have their highest diversity and species richness in the tropics today. The new fossils we have been discovering are also helping us shift paradigms and change the narrative about the timing and place of origin of several groups that have been regarded as high latitude in origin, moving to the tropics, and now we see a different pattern. So part of my projects include collaborating with a group of colleagues in a a project funded by the National Science Foundation to assemble the crab tree of life and investigate why do things keep evolving into crabs. And this is done with friends and colleagues from Harvard University and Florida International University and a net of collaborators from abroad. Another project I'm working on is on the evolution of compound eyes and visual systems. And fortunately, compound eyes being hard parts of the exoskeleton, they can also fossilize. And crabs are special because most arthropods out there have one specific eye type, and one is compound eyes, called the apposition eyes. But decapods and crabs in this case have up to four different eye types. So, how is that an organ so complex like an eye can be so plastic and evolve different forms and functions it sounds like you're busy uh (laughs) it's always room for more (laughs) okay with the um with the tropics and tropical paleontology with continental drift uh, the rocks that you're looking at are rarely from the place where they were originally deposited. For instance, the work that I've been doing in the Arctic, that used to be in the tropics in the Silurian. So does that lead you all around the world? Yes, it has. Um, 
because the tropics are dynamic and they shift as the time progresses and the plate the plates reaccommodate themselves uh, it has allowed me to investigate different moments of time and space but the uh, one of the beautiful things about the tropics to date at least the tropical south america or tropical americas is that they have been in a tropical position since the breakup of gondwana we're, so we're talking about that for mm. most of the Mesozoic and the Xenozoic, Northern South America has already been in a tropical position, which doesn't uh, in, doesn't doesn't require traveling to that far to keep putting those dots together in a similar latitudinal context. So you could actually study the rocks that you went to as a four-year-old. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and here I am trying to fulfill my childhood dream. <laughs> so I know you uh, from your work on decapods. I've, I've come across a lot of that work uh, and stuff as I've been looking around at my own kind of arthropod fossils. Uh, how did you begin working on decapods? Where did that interest develop? Has it always been crabby things or did you were you most interested in dinosaurs when you were little? As probably most kids, being paleontologists or not, I was fascinated by dinosaurs and big megafauna and teeth and bones. And of course, I wanted to study dinosaurs. Who doesn't? They are amazing. They are uh, interesting. They captivate our imagination. But it was at the end of my undergrad career when I was doing a one month long field expedition that one afternoon after walking, for many hours and kilometers, I just sat down to take a break and we were looking for a specific rock type from a specific moment of time in the Cretaceous. And I started just hammering rocks at 6 p.m. when I came across a layer full of fossil arthropods, things that at first I thought were spiders. But then these spider looking things had long tails with segments and then they had also pincers and they had things that do not match with spiders. And the more I learn about them, the more I recognize these are not spiders, these are crustaceans, and these are actually decapod crustaceans, things like shrimp, lobsters, and crabs. And when I try to do some preliminary research about what do we know about the fossil record of decapods in my country, in Colombia, where these first discoveries happened, I realized very little to nothing was known. So I took into the work of digging further into the matter, and the more I learn about fossil crustaceans, the more I fell in love with them. Yeah, it, it happened for me as well. You just you just start digging away at something, and it's like pulling a piece of wool on a jumper, and soon you're just pulling more and more, and you just can't get enough of it. <laughs> you just completely fall in love, and it just <laughs> takes you off on a tangent that you never thought you'd be going down, and, and then once you're in there, you can't think about anything else that's um, absolutely right so we've we've spoken about decapods on paleocast before it was it wasn't too long ago uh, in episode 96 i have that written down but uh, as a refresher could you tell everyone what a decapod actually is absolutely decapods are a group of crustaceans distantly related with creel pillbox or rollipollis amphipods, etc. Decapods are characterized by having eight pairs of thoracic appendages, from which the first three pairs are acting as mouth parts, and the other five pairs of limbs are acting as grasping appendages like pincers or claws, or as walking legs, hence the name decapoda, ten-footed crustaceans. And when do we first see them in the fossil record? Have they been around for a long time? Well, decapods are first known from uh, late Devonian fossils over 365 million years ago. But uh, molecular phylogenies have predicted that they can have an origin dating back into the Silurian or even the Ordovician over 400 million years ago. We don't have the fossils for them yet, but we will expect to find something decapod looking in those time frames as well. And do you have a favorite fossil decapod? 
I, I do have several favorite fossil decapods, but there is one that has a special spot in my heart, and its name is Calichimera perplexa, which has been called the platypus of the crab world, and even uh, has been called the baby Yoda of the crab world by the people <laughs> from the PBS Eons. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great nickname if you ask me. And so, yeah, I'm sure that people <laughs> might be aware of it from the PBS Eons. If you've not, if you don't know what it is, go and have a look. Um, so, yeah, coming into that with the PBS Eons, I was going to say that the crabs have received a whole lot of attention, a whole lot of love online recently. And maybe a lot of that has come from that episode of PBS Eons. But there's now loads of memes about how things just keep on evolving into crabs. So I wanted to ask, like, where did all of that come from? Why are people interested in crabs and talking about them? But then also, what is a crab? Is it just the shape of an animal, its morphology? Is it how it lives, its ecology? Or is it an actual biological group? All of these things related to each other are crabs. Well, crabs have fascinating have fascinated us as humans for thousands of years. They they have their own constellation and their own uh, nebula, the crab nebula and the Cancer constellation. They have played important parts in the folklore, in parades and festivities. They have an important role in the fisheries, and we consume them. But some of the people who eat shellfish, and they have also a part in the uh, aquaculture trade, and um, they resonate with different aspects of our daily lives. But also, they are very interestingly looking. Things that look like crabs are not crabs, and things that do not look like one end up being true crabs. So this fascination about the evolution of such a complex form, and why different groups have led to similar body shapes is what has captivated the imagination of the public alike in the last few years. So for your question of what is a crab, crabs as a whole, all together, they belong to a group of decapods called Mayura. And they are derived from shrimpy, shrimpy, lobstery-like ancestors, which split from them over 260 million years ago, give or take. And that split gave birth to two main groups of the of, of Mayurans. One is the false crabs or Anomura, and the true crabs or Brachura. What we usually called as crabs, the things we have in mind as crabs, are mostly true crabs or Brachura. Although we have things like hermit crabs and porcelain crabs and king crabs that are also crab looking, but they belong to a very different group. Okay. And uh, for your question about whether a, a crab is a morphology, an ecology, or an actual biological group, well, both groups, uh, the Anomurans and the Brachurans, compared to their other decapod relatives, they have a shortened tail, reduced tail that is not fleshy and muscular as in a lobster or a shrimp. And such a tail in crabs uh, can be also tucked underneath the body for protection. So now they don't have to drag this very delicious uh, extension of their body, which in turn provides them with some protection from predation. Crabs also share a few features, including the presence of only one pair of grasping appendages in the front of the body, pincers or claws. The other four limbs tend to be walking legs compared to shrimp or lobster, which can have from three to five pairs of clawed limbs. So both, crab can be actually both. It could be a morphology in itself, but also a natural biological group. Okay, and what are the advantages of this crab-like morphology? You've talking about how the tail can stick to the underside uh, of the body, uh, which I, I never knew until I was like 30 that that's what it was. Kind of looks like a, <laughs> a pair of upside down underpants or something <laughs> stuck on there. <laughs> but are there, are there any other well, advantages? <laughs> we, can, we can 
Let's introduce a term here, and the term is carcinization. And uh, it has been defined through time as the processes of evolving a crab-looking body form. And this carcinization, if we think of an archetypical crab, they have round, big bodies that are compressed dorsoventrally, and they have big pincers or claws and walking legs and a little tail tucked underneath the body. And it comes down to the flexibility of the body plan of a crab and what that implies in terms of reducing predation, occupying new spaces from the depths of the oceans to caves and rivers and even climbing trees. They also allow them to go more places that other decapods have never been able to go. Uh, let's say uh, the firm land which uh, shrimp and lobster are not famous for being terrestrial, but crabs have, and they have, in fact, conquered land and fresh water multiple times independently. So whatever the crab morphology uh, comes from, the, it is giving them an edge to occupy new spaces that other of their distant relatives haven't been able to. So one of the interesting things that came out of the decapod uh, interview we did earlier is a discussion about the ontogeny, how they grow. And people will know that arthropods grow by having uh, what we call instars. So every, they have like stages of growth in which uh, in between everyone, they shed their exoskeleton, but that allows them to have uh, different kind of shapes and exoskeletons in between and some uh, crustaceans can have ridiculously different kinds of shapes overall shapes between uh, every stage in this life cycle do do we see that in the true crabs do they ever have wildly different instars they do they certainly do in fact they have very abrupt jumps uh between those stages so baby tiny baby crabs start their life as a larval stale, a stage called zoea and the zoea is characterized by this roundish carapace with a long rostrum a very long frontal spine and another similar extending backwards big roundish eyes that are not concealed within orbits and a long tail that they use for swimming with their uh, feathery appendages or like swimmerets and then they metamorphose through some of these zoea stages into a transitional stage between the larval and the post larval called the megalopa and megalopa means mega big alopa eyes, so big eyes. And they look dramatically different from the zoea stages. And this interface between the zoea and the post larval stages lasts for only one or two instance, instars uh, at all before morphing into the little tiny versions of what will become adults. So, one of the things about uh, crab evolution is that you can play with the evolution of different body forms by accelerating or delaying the timing of expression of some of those changes. And sometimes you can even produce juvenile looking adults by retention of so, some of those early characters and something we call heterochrony. So the, the classic uh, crab morphology is just it's part of the latter stage of its life cycle. Does each one of those have a different ecology that's associated with it, a, a different way of life? They do. They do. Zoea are usually open water swimmers. They move in the water column in the pelagic realm. And if we talk about uh, most crabs are benthic, they live in the floor, let, let, let it be the floor of the ocean or the floor of a jungle or the floor of a river. So, but they live at the bottoms. When it's the floor, I mean the bottoms. Uh, and the transition from a free swimming pelagic larval stage to a more permanent bottom dweller, dwelling uh, adult form is bridged by this megalopa stage, which starts in the water column 
And then they find populations where other adults are already and they recruit themselves into these populations by settling and then morphing into the final benthic stages. Wait a second, I've just had a thought. So the terrestrial crabs, the one that lives in the jungle, what do they do for their first instart? Are, are they marine? And then each juvenile, as it becomes an adult, has to make the transition from marine to terrestrial? That is a fantastic question that has a lot of branchings to it. <laughs> the reason why is great because it's not straightforward. There are some crabs, as I mentioned before, have colonized or conquered or in, may have an incursion into non-marine habitats multiple times. And the way they have done it comes from different pathways. For instance, if we think about the Christmas Island red crab, they they live in the forest. These huge land dwelling crabs live in the forest, that, like thousands of meters, kilometers inland, and they undergo these massive migrations to the shores for the females to release their larvae at certain moments of the year where the tides allow the to swap the, the larva offshore. And they undergo all of their larval stage metamorphosis in the ocean before these tiny bebes called megalopa return back to shore and start migrating upland uh, to become post-larval, finally adults. So that's a huge change of habitat from an obligated marine um, larval stage to a fully terrestrial adult stage. But then you have things that are freshwater and you have amphibious crabs that can move from land to freshwater in a more continental setting. And in many of these groups, the larva also uh, has to develop, but in, they do not develop in the water column. Because think of a river, there is a dynamic, most of the time rivers are dynamic, so they are carrying the larva downstream and they would be end up in different places or eaten eaten by anything else. So these crabs, like freshwater crabs, have evolved a strategy where they become uh, direct developers. So the larva development happens in the belly of the mother and they hatch as teeny tiny versions of the adults. So they have skipped that jump from having a water dependent larval stage to a direct development that allows them to become uh, to avoid predation and be able to settle as proper post-larval stages. Oh, that's amazing. I, I'm in awe of crustaceans at times. Really, I am. <laughs> Despite being a chelicerate that's worker. That's so weird. <laughs> well, they're all arthropods, and arthropods are fascinating by themselves, and they account for the vast majority of life in the planet, and not surprisingly why. They have done things very well since the early beginning. So um, going into that much depth with this question uh my next question is why do they walk sideways it's not quite as uh, <laughs> not quite as in depth as the last one but <laughs> hey um that is also a question that requires uh, a closer look at their crab tree of life and the evolution of carcinization the crab like form Many crabs do walk sideways, and uh, those are the typical crabs we can think of. Dungeness crabs, and king crabs, and um, ghost crabs, and fiddler crabs, etc., etc. The reason they can do it, and the reason why they do it, is because their anatomy restricts their motion to happen that way. So if you think of an animal like a, a lobster like a squat lobster which is an anomure and a false crab but it's more lobstery looking or shrimpy looking than than crabby looking they can walk back and forth like frontwards in the anterior posterior direction um, the reason why is because they have a narrower chest and the base of their legs the coxa uh, are more space among themselves allowing them for more degrees of motion same happened with a lot of other false and true crabs. But when these particular groups of true crabs become highly carcinized, their body expands laterally so much that their chest plates also expand a lot, bringing the legs way farther away from each other. And that 
has a consequence on the ways the limbs can be moved. And the best way to move when you have the legs that way is sideways. But they can also maneuver around it. So they are not, they do not always walk sideways. They can move back and forth, like front, back, um, but it's case dependent. So one of the other beauties of crabs, everything makes sense in the light of evolution, except crabs <laughs> sometimes is a joke because they can do so many things and they break so many of the rules that for every example of what they do, there is always an exception. So you mentioned at the start, one of your research projects was looking at the uh, the visual systems, the eyes of decapods as a whole. Do they make good study systems for compound eye visual systems? And if so, why? Most of the arthropods with compound eyes have... Uh, the given eye type that is called the apposition eye. And that eye type allows the light from the exterior, from the outer world to hit the retina via a single channel. Each of these unitary elements called omateria with their own lens can funnel the light down into the retina, like if it was pouring water in a glass. And even though this holds true for most, let's say, crustaceans in this case, with compound eyes, there are some groups, and pan crustaceans, including insects, some groups have evolved different ways of catching that light. And by doing so, they have also changed the way the eyes internally are structured, and even externally in the shape of their facets and their packing. A few of those examples are moths, a few groups of moths, a few groups of nocturnal beetles, and crabs among decapod crustaceans. So this is fascinating that an organ so complex and so specifically uh, tailored to their ecology and what they do, it has the flexibility to evolve into different forms and functions. So one of the goals of our current research is to understand how the crab eyes have led to four different ways of doing the things, seeing the world and capturing light from an ancestral eye type. What is really, really cool about this is that you can see different eye types in a single species through their ontogeny. No. So all baby crabs, it's so mind blowing. All baby crabs start their life in, as larva with the apposition eye type. And they can facultatively migrate pigments back into the retina so they are not as shiny and they can they avoid predation in the water column. But that is like a, you know, you know quote unquote, pre-adaptation for what could become a completely different visual system in their post-larval life, such as superposition, where the light actually, uh, the eye inside has a clear zone because of those pigments that are retreated back into the retina, that light from hitting different omateria can actually deflect and get to the uh, retina from different pathways to optimize the light capture. But that can happen in a single species across their lifetime. And that is fascinating. How can you go from a larval apposition eye with hexagonal facets in a honeycomb packing to an abrupt a superposition eye of the mirror type where the facets are square and packed like in boxes and they operate mechanically very different. It is one of the questions we want to answer through my research and research with colleagues, but it's one of the most challenging because that imply taking a deeper look at things like ecology and development and their interplay with phylogeny. So let's focus it down now on the uh, fossil record of the brachyurans, the true crabs. When did they first evolve? When do we first see their fossils? The first fossil brachyurans or true crabs that we can pinpoint in the fossil record are approximately 190 million years old. And the oldest representative of this is called Eocarcinus precursor. It comes from the early Jurassic of England. And the important thing about this animal is that it looks different than other groups of crabs, let's say the false crabs. It already sports a more crabby, crabby body form. And yet it's not quite there into the crab body plan as we think of it today. 
in contrast with other crabs, like true crabs at least, Eocarcinus had really long antenna, whereas most living crabs have actually very short antenna, and, and fossil crabs too. And Eocarcinus also has a relatively long tail that is tucked uh, backwards, it's like on top outside of the body, compared to most other crabs who have already reduced it and tuck it under the carapace. And the carapace itself is not roundish, flattened like a pancake, it's more like cylindrical, a little bit lobstery. So even though Eocarcinus precursor can be the oldest crab like fossil known to date, it is still not. Uh, the ancestor of the modern groups as we think of them right now. So if this species of crab didn't have the the classic kind of carcinized shape, were the true crabs the first ones to actually have this shape? Or did they also convergently uh, come across a, a carcinized shape themselves? As we... As we- see it right now, we can envision the process of carcinization or evolving a crap, a proper crap looking body form that to have happened at least five times among Mayurans or crabs in the broad sense. Three times within Anomura and at least two times within Brachyura. And I'm saying at least is because uh, the fossil record can tell us otherwise, uh, different pathways towards carcinization. But yes, this uh, overall body anatomy construction can arise in different groups independently, which invites the question of what is so special about that body form that is making organisms innovate and evolving it independently so many times. But, but which one was first? The non-crab looking for him. Is that what you yeah, mean? Did I, did I answer your question? Apparently no. <laughs> it's not how many other times it's are crabs the original crab-shaped things or did they also convergently uh, come across this crab shape? Right. Okay. So in that case and along those lines there are other groups that have evolved somewhat crab-like body forms and i don't want to say crab-like in the strict sense but more like they have derived from elongated more shrimpy ancestors into or lobster ancestors into something that is more compact as a typical crab a couple of those groups include polychelidan lobsters, which are famous through the Jurassic and part of the Cretaceous. They are flattened, very flattened and broad. And those circular disc-like carapaces are more similar to the body that you would expect to see in a crab than in a lobster. And another example are cycloids. And cycloids are this really strange arthropod group. We still don't know what they are. They look like mites, they look like parasites in a way, flattened, circular, disc-shaped things um, that must have evolved from something different, something more shrimpy looking in a way, or more or not carcinized. So carcinization per se can only be applied to crabs, but the phenomenon of undergoing such a dramatic shift of body form can be seen in some other groups. Funny or interestingly enough, none of those groups have made it to the same level as crab did or have taken it to the level that true crabs have taken it. Are there any noteworthy groups of extinct true crabs? There are. There are several noteworthy groups. I can think of some that are quite remarkable by, by their own means. One of them are called the Dacotipancroids. And these animals have a fossil record in the Cretaceous, mostly from North America and a few from Europe. And they are like any true crab that you can think of today. Very sturdy, roundish carapaces, tiny tails, big claws, etc. And yet they belong 
to an early stock of crabs that are typically not your crabby, crabby looking fossils. On the other hand, we have Calichimera perplexa, which is by itself a baffling offshoot in the crab tree of life that instead of looking more like a crab or carcinized, they, it went the other way. It decarcinized. It sported a more elongated, fusiform body, more lobster-like body. Instead of having tiny eyes, it had two huge, round, big eyes that if we put it in context, the size proportion to the body is like if you and I had eyes the size of volleyballs. And it also has a little tail that protrudes backwards, so it's completely sh dr drifting away from your typical crab body form. And these are fossils, right? So there is things about the evolution of form through time that can only be seen through the lens of the fossil record. And how good is the fossil record of crabs in general? The fossil record of crabs in general is good, especially when we get into younger rocks, let's say Cretaceous and the Cenozoic, because of the time and because there's more has been more species evolving through time. It's a group that has become more diverse in both in terms of number of species and anatomy through time, but also in terms of the environments they inhabit that also enhances the preservation of such fossils. The earliest fossil crabs tend to be small coral reef dweller things. And most of the time, the fossil record is restricted to isolated, tiny fragmentary carapaces or remains of their claws. And is during the Cretaceous, even though they have a Jurassic origin, is during the Cretaceous that we start seeing them occupying different ecospaces different habitats, doing different things, and then also being fossilized in different sediments, which allow for a more complete preservation. One of the good things is that by that time, true crab, robust claw, big pincer, big carapace uh, groups already evolved, which facilitates their fossilization because of the sturdiness of their body parts. And in these different environments, is, is the some that uh, promotes the preservation of crabs are there some that we'll probably just never find uh, fossils of crabs in. And so what I'm asking is, is there a, a bias in the fossil of record crab in the fossil record of crabs that promotes those of a, a certain environment over another? Absolutely. Um, most fossil crabs that we can think of, in fact, most crab species are marine and they have been marine for since the beginning of the group over 200 million years ago. And as such, they have more space to fossilize because there is more oceanic water than continental water, but also because those settings will allow for a more calm depositional settings that will preserve such fossils. And when we move to continental or non-marine habitats, let's say mainland or freshwater, the environments themselves have way less uh, preservational potential for animals such as crustaceans, in this case crabs, because they become disarticulated really fast and because their thin shells are crushed and dissolve really fast as well. And that's why we don't have a good fossil record of land dwelling crabs or fresh water crabs. We can call them overall non-marine crabs. And that is an issue when we try to bridge the gap in our understanding of the timing and place and mode of invasion of novel habitats from a marine ancestor in crabs. So if you were to find a crab that had a very strong association to the land, that would be quite impressive, wouldn't it? Most definitely, and especially if such a fossil would happen to be a very complete one. Uh, kind of like your recent paper, perhaps. Exactly, and that is one of those lucky strikes where all the factors allowing for preservation of a fossil help um, making a one-of-a-kind discovery that otherwise, otherwise would be impossible to see in the fossil record.
Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Fish Ren Cat, and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So, if you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.